There are very few moments in history in which the structure of our world is fundamentally redefined. There are chapters of our world's history of which we weren't quite originally sure of the ending. World War II, the Cold War, the COVID pandemic, just to name a few. But now, the war in Ukraine is yet another pivotal moment upon which the structure and rules of our future world order will hinge. In eighth grade, I gave a TED talk on Vladimir Putin, his life, rise to power, political ambitions. Totally normal subject for an eighth grader, I know. I mean, who wouldn't want to learn about the feats of a man who can fearlessly ride a bear and look good while doing so? But what seemed comedic then has since turned to catastrophe. Because, as I'm sure you're all aware, on February 24th of this year, Vladimir Putin launched what he dubbed a, quote, special military operation to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. But, as we all know, this was just Putin talk for what was really a bloody invasion and full-scale war. In retaliation, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky implemented martial law. Western arms began to flood into Ukraine for the first time. And the Russian government was met with harsh international backlash. But despite all of that, the guns did not stop firing. Groups from both sides advanced and addressed from different parts of the Russo-Ukrainian border. Here at home, our news headlines became saturated with articles, stories, narratives, and anecdotes from the conflict. And we began reaching out to Ukrainian civilians, refugees, and soldiers. And amid all of that, we were finally able to get a glimpse of what this conflict was. An attack on freedom everywhere. But despite all of our speculation about what this conflict was, the most common question we confronted ourselves with within the first few days of the conflict was, quite simply, why? Why did Vladimir Putin launch this invasion? Was he mentally unstable, as so many theorized? Was he desperate for a political popularity boost ahead of his next election? Why did he provoke the West in a time of unprecedented global nuclear capability? And what were his motivations for sparking the first major European conflict since the Second World War? And as it turns out, the question seems complex, but and actually look to what Putin has said himself. In 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, a then young Vladimir Putin was working as a KGB intelligence officer in East Germany. And he was devastated. He watched as hundreds of his fellow Russian citizens and friends were suddenly split across dozens of newly created nations in the Soviet Union. And in his words, he described it as or the greatest catastrophe of the century. You see, for Putin, the demise of the Soviet Union and just more broadly the Russian Empire were not just minor political events. They were humiliations, utter disasters that needed to be rectified. And worryingly, his foreign policy has largely followed through with that vision. Looked at actions in Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea, and perhaps most worryingly this year, look no further than the nearly 7,000 word essay Putin published arguing Ukraine is a made up country. It does not exist. Historical Russian land, Russian people, that Russia should be free to come and enter. Now, others argue that we've got this all wrong. In reality, the conflict was caused by the West. Years of NATO and Western military expansion pushed Putin to the brink. But while this analysis might at first seem enticing, it's misguided. Because Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia all joined NATO without any Russian provocation. And Ukraine did not and does not present a serious military threat to Russia, either prior to or after the invasion. So there's clearly something else going on here. And as it turns out, 
Blaming the West is certainly a convenient excuse for what was really, as we all know, a traditional war of conquest. Others argue it's much simpler than all of this. The invasion was politically motivated. Putin was seeking to create a patriotic, nationalistic rally around the flag effect before his future election. And an invasion was a great way to do that. And while this theory is partially correct, it also misses the broader narrative of Russian strategic action in recent years. We take a look at things like authoritarian crackdowns at home, interference with Western and American elections abroad, Russian military action and backing of dictators in places like Syria with Bashar al-Assad. Clear that Putin harbors something greater, fundamental desire and vision to restore Russia to the superpower status it maintained under the Soviet Union. Now, despite all of that, in reality, all these theories have some credence and some truth to them. So the important question then is not necessarily what this conflict is or why it started, but how we can best respond to it. Because that crucial decision will carry implications not just in Ukraine, but around the entire globe. This summer, I was in Almaty, Kazakhstan, studying Russian. And while well, Ka the Kazakh people were totally pro-Russia prior to the invasion, pro-military, economic, cultural ties, after this February, that perception changed overnight. And the reasoning is relatively simple. Kazakhs fear that they will be next. And they're not alone. Georgians, Moldovans, people in the Baltics, Poles. All are scared that if Putin gets his way in Ukraine, what's to stop him from expanding even further? And what will happen if, like the scare we had this November 15th, which is a few weeks ago, an astray Russian missile happens to strike a Western military target this time? Maybe the Baltics or Poland come under direct attack. Now, the U.S. will be at war with the world's largest nuclear superpower. But despite all of that, the greatest danger is that the Russian military invasion of Ukraine casts a shadow far beyond Kyiv. In reality, it's become just a microcosm of the broader clash between revisionist autocracies and liberal democracies for the control of strategic territories and the regional narrative. Should Russia be victorious in its aggressive pursuit against Ukraine? What's to stop other authoritarian belligerent actors around the world from doing the exact same thing? Rising China could become more aggressive in its military adventures against Taiwan. Rogue North Korea could expand its missile testing and provocations against America's closest allies in East Asia. Even countries as far away as Iran could become emboldened knowing full well that if they threaten the United States with enough force, we will back down. The result of this implication would be a more dangerous world, one where revisionist belligerent actors are free to roam the world and their regional neighborhoods, and major war once again becomes a likely possibility. But despite all of these broad foreign policy predictions, it's also important to take a step back and really zoom in on the humanitarian impact that this crisis has had and goes so often ignored in the media. So far, nearly 44 million Ukrainians have been directly affected by this conflict, 14 million of which men, women, children have been displaced, missing or killed, subjected to unspeakable crimes by the Russian military, forced to flee to unknown lands, and perhaps worst of all, do not know when they'll be able to return home, or even if they'll have a home to return to. For a moment, I'd like all of us to put ourselves in the shoes of Ukrainians forced to carry only the bare possessions we can carry in our hands and the clothes on our backs and flee from our home. Our family, our rooms, our desks, our parks, our friends, 
everything we know and everything we love is gone. It almost seems unfathomable for us in the West, but it's a reality that tens of billions of people face not only in Ukraine, but all over the globe every single day. These people have lost the self-determination, right to movement, the right to say what they want to say, to talk to who they want to. It's unthinkable. So, in a time when global freedom is at stake, when rights, basic necessities have become conditional for millions of people around the world, and we're watching our brothers and sisters in another part of the world suffer, it's time for us to act. So, when politicians or the public make the argument that we should back down, focus on domestic issues, or not provoke militaristic conflict with Russia, it's important to ask yourself, not only as citizens of the US, but citizens of the world, what is at stake for the globe? Bowing to Putin is unacceptable. And the truth is, only we, as Americans, have the power to stop it. And already, with our support, tides of the war are quickly turning. After nearly nine months of fighting, Russia has failed to achieve any of its goals. On top of recent Ukrainian liberation in the east and south, are signaling optimism in a rapidly shifting balance of power. But at the same time, it's also important to not get overconfident because amid gradually rising isolationism and nationalist sentiment in the West, our support must not give in. Putin has reopened a fundamentally dangerous and insidious chapter in the world's history book. And it's only up to us and our allies to close it for good.